like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. G'day there, it's Paul Joy here and welcome to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. Thanks for joining us. Today I sit down with Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012 and I'm going to ask Lauren a little bit about what her schooling was like, what her experiences were like, but also what that has taught her about life, about music, about decision making and choices. And I sense that when Lauren was a student while I was here at Yarra, um, that she was somebody who was fairly tuned in and ready to take on opportunities. And I'm going to explore with her today whether or not she took on board some of those opportunities and what they have turned into. I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012. Welcome back to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. And this is the podcast where we get to sit down with Yarra old grammarians, yogs, who have sat in these seats, they've walked these corridors, they've played on these sports fields, they've performed on our stage, they have worn the uniform and you worn it with pride. And today we get to reflect and wander down memory lane a little bit with Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012. Lauren, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's good to uh, actually be able to see you again, though it is interesting times. It's see you from a great distance, a vast distance. Tell me right out of the gate, from school to home and home to school, what was the sort of the travel situation for you? How did you get from where you uh, lived to getting to school? What was that experience well, like? Uh, it changed uh, year to year, depending on how old I was. I was pretty lucky in that I lived in Croydon Hills when I was at school, so it was walking distance. But uh, being a music student, I always wanted to get to school early to practice. So luckily for me, my mum dropped me off um, and my brother when he was there. Uh, and then coming home in middle school, I would walk home with my best friend, uh, which was really nice because he lived around the corner from me. So we would dawdle home, take us a good 25 minutes to dawdle our way home. And as we got older and our friends started driving, well, that, that became more and more fun. So, Very good. And, and in the midst of um, heading home either with instruments or was it like a, a, a large load of instruments you carried or was it uh, you leave them here? Well, I guess oh, I wouldn't want to admit too many of my secrets in case uh, Mr. Scott Templeton is listening about how much I may or may not have practiced. But uh, no, when I was, I think when I was younger, I took it home more often. In middle school um, but fortunately for me uh, my best friend at the time often carried it home for me the gentleman that he was um, a shout out Michael honey how you going um, and as we got older um, yeah I mean for me it was usually alto saxophone which was about five kilos um, but as I got older I got a better case which took some weight off and also got some friends that could drive so you know I'm no tuba player so no complaints no, that's right. And it's not like you were carting home a drum kit or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Somehow I don't think I would have done that. But I think also as I got older, I opted to leave it in the school storage area and just come in early and practice at school instead. My neighbours didn't much like the sound of, you know, cat dying sort of saxophone sounds. So. <laughs> and, and it would be fair to say that as a middle school student, there would be many other um screaming cat sounds as young students try these new instruments they give it a go you've pursued it you continue to keep learning and keep trying and you persisted what would be a recommendation or your advice to up-and-coming musicians like and parents perhaps at that stage where it really does sound like screaming cats well I think it's um it's something that I come across a lot in my life at the moment um but I think my generally my advice particularly to young young kids or young parents that are just starting their instrument, is that unlike anything else you've ever tried before, you're not going to be good at this at the start. No matter whether you are naturally talented, though I don't really believe in that, or not, it's going to take a while before you get good at it. So the challenge is not, am I or am I not good, give it up, get into it. The challenge is, am I or am I not persistent and dedicated to, to really give something a go and that giving it a go is not two weeks, it's actually a couple of years. And it seems to me that you were committed, you were dedicated. How long before you started to see some, actually, I'm making progress here, I'm going to stick with it? 
Well, I think uh, in truth, I, I wasn't particularly dedicated when I was younger. I was fortunate that uh, my mom in particular was was really gung ho about me learning music from a young age um, and that I had set up a lot of those practice habits in primary school when I started with piano. Uh, but when I got to high school, yeah, I wasn't particularly, I don't think I was internally or, or personally very dedicated, but it was it was cultural. Everyone learned an instrument in year seven. We were very lucky to have that opportunity and everyone gave it a go. Whether or not they practiced is is a, a mystery to all of us, I suppose. But um, in the early years, uh, it wasn't me that was persistent and dedicated. It was my family and more importantly, my teachers that were persistent in encouraging me to want to, to play something. But I think in terms of actually getting something out of it, it was probably around about year nine when I started learning jazz and started entering the jazz bands at school. Um, when things really started to feel like they shifted for me. I can, I can vividly remember a solo that I was given um, in year nine in one of the bands uh, that we were rehearsing. And, and I, I can really vividly remember plucking up my feathers, feeling very strong and very, oh, hi, I'm okay at this. I can do this. So, uh, Perform that more than once? Or was that sort of a, a all building up to one performance? And, and if so, how did you go? Like, because there's one thing to practice and rehearse, and then it's another thing when the, you know, the lights come on and the crowd goes quiet. How was that feeling? Oh gosh, honestly, I mean, we were very lucky uh, at Yarra in our time that we had so many performance opportunities with assemblies and all that kind of thing, and also all the concerts and shows and stuff that we put on. Uh, but I, I can still feel it in my chest the fear that I felt. It was, I had a very, very strong sense of um, stage fright, I suppose, um, which. I think surprised a lot of my mates at the time because I was such an outgoing and loud person in every other facet of my life, but the stage fright was real. I can, I can feel my heart pumping at the idea of it. I can't feel my fingers. You can't, and you know, trying to play a wind instrument when you can't breathe and when, when you're choking on air is, is not an easy feat. So I think most of my performances at high school, more what I remember is the feeling of fear uh, than the actual, did I even play the notes nicely or not I, I don't know but um, it certainly developed though as I as I went along it, it got easier yes yes that that's true I mean you're quite right there are certain performances where you can potentially get away with a bit of nerves you can get away with a bit of stage fright but as you suggest when you've got to control your breath and uh, you know can manage the pitch and the the timing of it and all of that it's really uh there's some concentration going on there and some real mind over your body I, I well absolutely and it's a lot more physical than people suspect even the non-wind instruments you know I play piano as well and and every instrument it's a lot more physical than than people see and I think it's important for young performers to know that as much as you might feel that you are bright red and shaking and cannot breathe no one can see it but you uh, which is a really strange phenomenon that you can feel such an overwhelming, huge sensation all over your body, but no one can see it. So learning to control that emotion um, and anticipate it and be aware of it and also accept it while also learning to control the parts of your body that are uh, impacted by it to be able to play your instrument is is a really important skill. And I think that's one of the many reasons why young people are encouraged to learn music amongst the other, you know, Music makes you good at languages. It helps you develop all kinds of dedication, discipline, la, la, la. But it actually, I believe it, it, it brings you closer to a connection with your body that you don't really have as a, as a young person or as a teenager. And it helps you to learn some of those meditation and mindfulness techniques that unfortunately a lot of young people don't naturally have and need to learn. And I think music really uh, connects you to yourself in that way. That's a fascinating perspective, not one that I've heard before, because even though nowadays lots and lots of people and our students would be hearing about the value of mindfulness and, and about the, 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 the benefits of meditation and those sorts of things, my experience of performance often is somebody standing behind a lectern. So I'm talking about a performance where, you know, maybe there's a preacher or somebody speaking mm. and, and they have the uh, the barrier, almost the something to hide behind is the lectern. But when you're performing particularly a solo, you, 
you don't have that barrier. You and yet, you, what you're suggesting? Oh, uh, you know, I, I think you do in many ways. Um, as you speak there, and you're talking about having the lectern there, I'm reflecting on the time I spent with you when when I was in middle school about learning to speak, uh, public speak behind a lectern, and it is very similar to playing an instrument. And I think. You might not realize, but be it playing piano, playing trumpet, playing saxophone, whatever, that you do have something to hide behind. And I think that, that there's actually a lot of truth in that, in that a lot of musos go into music because it is them and their instrument in their own little plastic bubble or imaginary plastic bubble, uh, whereas singing or dancing is very exposed in a very different way. Y- yes, that's true. So y- you... You don't hide behind your instrument, but that is somewhere between you and your audience. Yeah, it's your own little safety bubble. Yes, yes. And with anything that you're performing, if you're going to get to a performance level, a high level, you're going to spend a lot of time with that instrument. You're going to practice a lot. So you become really comfortable in that space with you and your instrument. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes home in a lot of ways, and I think it's in it's important for... Uh, young musicians to realize and accept that that's not always a happy place it, it is for me and, and for most musos the happiest place you can experience it is the definition of home for me me and and my horn in that little bubble you know it's it's a hug really but it's also the definition of challenge and frustration and uh you know uh, coming to terms with what you can and can't do or are or are not able to currently master um, so it, it is not all, you know, flashing lights and fun as much as that is certainly there. It It is, it's a challenging relationship with your instrument. And I think a lot of young people would, would be thinking, listening to this going, oh, well, I just want to throw my saxophone against the wall. I hate it. Yeah, you do. And there are times when I do, you know, but there are also times where I have this connection with my instrument and my sound that is unlike any connection you can ever experience in any other part of the world for me. Um, so it's, it's the authenticity that you've spoken about there, because if we go back just a little while in our conversation, you talked about year nine, the opportunity to, to kind of puff your chest out and ruffle your feathers and sort of stand firm and, and deliver and then acknowledge, actually, that was good. I can do this. And you've continued to practice and rehearse and, and now you've um, continued your career in music. But equally, there are days when dare I say, you too want to throw that horn through the window. Is that Well, certainly. I mean, there are days when I want to throw myself through the window. You know, the horn didn't do anything wrong, you know, (laughs) but absolutely. And I think that's that's actually the reason I went into music in the first place. It it wasn't a plan for me. It was never even an option. It wasn't on my year 12 preferences at the start. It wasn't, it was something that I did as an extracurricular. It wasn't, it wasn't my whole identity. It wasn't my plan for my life, but I think what became so attractive about it later on is that it was so challenging, not in a, this is hard, you got to play fast notes or in a, you know, maths is challenging because you've got to focus and it's hard to understand, but in a personally challenging way, this is, this is challenging my resilience, my discipline, my understanding of who I am and what I can do and how I relate to the world. Wow. That's a beautiful reflection on the journey that you've been on and your love at times and frustration at times with with music and the art and craft of learning an instrument and then being able to perform that and play and and bring joy and emotion to other people who are listening to it It, it's it's stunning no wonder you still do it yeah well you know they say that they say there are two types of musicians there's the louis armstrongs and the miles davis so for those who don't know louis armstrong was a trumpet player and singer in the early part of the 20th century and he was all about he was a showman, you know, he wanted to, he wanted to spread joy and love with everyone. He wanted to show off. He wanted to make people laugh and smile and he would do anything to get that from his audience and everything. Whereas Miles Davis later on, uh, he was more introspective, I suppose, more reflective. He, he presented himself in a way, perhaps not entirely truthfully, that he didn't care what anyone thought or what anyone played. And as soon as it became cool, or as soon as what he did became similar to what other people were doing. He wasn't into it anymore. But I think truthfully what the analogy is about is that he played music for himself and for his connection with his instrument and his sound. And that, that was it for him. And the connection that he had with his bandmates and the community and his audience was an added bonus. Whereas for Louis Armstrong, it was the opposite for him. It was all about that connection uh, with his audience and, and with music and with the band, but the playing the instrument stuff 
was an added bonus. So there's two types of musos in, in my head. There's the Louis, the people people players, and there's the Miles who are all about that inner bubble. And, and that's always been me, the Miles. Okay. Not that I'm comparing myself to Miles Davis. Don't, don't, don't take that impression. <laughs> Wow, that's uh, that, that's a great analogy, though, and and people who have perhaps watched both of those great performers um, would be able to resonate, knowing a little bit more of that backstory and and a little bit of that personal struggle that comes to um, the performance and the the, the whole love hate relationship that they might have with music itself. Definitely, I think for me, when I first heard the analogy uh, when I was at uni, it it was. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure of the word, but it, it it was almost like, oh, okay. Now I understand where I fit into all of this. It it made what I was doing make sense. It it uh, it allowed me to to connect to music in the way that I wanted to, and not feel ashamed that I didn't connect to the need to please an audience or even the want to please an audience. I didn't have that connection that that most musos have because it certainly is more common to connect to music in that way. Um, and it, it was validating, I guess, to hear that analogy and go okay, this is a, that's a different way to, to perceive your, your connection through music. And it, and it really started a lifelong love of this is, this is me for the rest of my life. And I love it. What a magnificent discovery to, uh, to, to find. And, and I get and a shock as well. I've got to say it was a shock to me at the time. I wasn't, I wasn't aiming for this or trying for this. It was shock. <laughs> and now that you're there, Lauren, are you, is it giving you what you were hoping for, looking for, searching for? Is it is it all it's cracked up to be? It's so much more. It's so much more. <laughs> it's such a hard question to answer. You know, when when I was growing up, I was, you know, from, from the minute that I could speak, all I can remember, I always wanted to be a vet. I had planned to be a vet. I studied every science subject available at school. I was a straight A student. I was a high achiever and I was a perfectionist. I was horribly... Um, very certain of myself and very sure of exactly where I was going to go. Um, and it wasn't until right near the end of year 12 when one of my music teachers, my mentor and now dear friend, uh, Than Pointer, said to me, wait, so you're going to study vet medicine? Then why are you coming into school an hour early every day to practice? Why aren't you sitting in the chemistry lab with your books? Why are you here every day after school for ensembles? Why are you on this bus right now? We're coming back from a music tour or something. Um, and at the time, I think I, you know, in, in classic 18 year old Lauren form, I think I argued with him and went, oh yeah, whatever, whatever, Mr. Pointer. Uh, but, but it struck a, it struck a chord with me and, and it changed my life. He encouraged me to audition for a music degree. And, and so I, I put it on my list as a, oh yeah, I could do that for a year, you know, take a gap year through music. Um, and when I eventually did my audition and I was accepted, I remember coming home and I actually just spoke to my mum about this earlier in the week. Um, when I got accepted, that that was it. It clicked for me. It was like I, I didn't know that this was a, an option. I didn't realise that this was something that I was actually legitimately passionate about, not just a this is my extracurricular. Um, and it after the first few weeks at uni of studying it, for me it became, oh, my gosh, this is not a side hustle. This is not a thing that I'm doing for fun because I'm 18 this is a challenge. This is, this is, um, I suppose a pilgrimage that I didn't even realize that I was on. Um, and everything that I had wanted about, you know, being the perfect student and going into veterinary medicine just completely flew out the window. And I'm often asked by my family and friends, you know, do you think you'll ever go back to it? Did you make the right choice? And it's, there's no question about it. It, it totally changed all of my goals for life. And, what I thought I was, who I thought I wanted to become was, was changed from that moment. And I guess I'm just really grateful to have had all of those opportunities at my feet at Yarra um, to have then made a split second decision because I had the options. One of the things that strikes me though, is that it is a discovery. It's not, it's not something that you wake up one day and decide because it seems to me like it was years in the making, but for all of those years, you were still moving forward. You were still stepping through opportunities. There was a door, you knocked on it, it opened, and so you pursued that, you tried that. It wasn't like you were sitting in a ball waiting for something to come launching and strike you, but in fact, you were pursuing opportunities and options and then had the, uh, I guess, the state of mind to say, actually, 
I wonder what's possible if I turn left instead of turning right. And I just want to, you to speak for a moment on the notion of just keeping moving, making a decision and, and moving in that direction. Well, I think um, a lot of what you've said is true, but I, I think also had I been in a different place or in a less fortunate or privileged position as I was at Yarra, then these things might not have happened. In fact, they wouldn't have happened because I was encouraged by my teachers. I was taken under the wing um, by by my teacher and director. Uh, Scott Templeton was was really a bit of a father figure to me in that he, he really led me through this as a you don't have to be born with it. You don't have to be great at this. And I certainly wasn't when I started. Um, but this is something that you can do. This is something that there is joy in. This is something that is rewarding. This is something that brings you closer to a community. Like you are welcome here, even though you're not as good as the guy next to you. Um, it's not about that. Um, and I, that was really encouraging. And I think maybe that might have been uh, Than's point all those years later was that yeah, sure, maybe you, you deep down at some point wanted to study medicine, but throughout my high school years, I became connected through this community and through these opportunities that were very lovingly um, provided to me, um, as lucky as I was to be there. And I I wouldn't have had the, the chance to explore these opportunities had those people have not supported me through it and, and shown those things to me. And I think at the time... Yeah, I developed slowly and I, I gradually got better. And, and that was true across the board at Yarra. I think that's something that's resonated with, I've been listening to some of the other previous podcasts with the other yogs. And that's something, a theme that comes up a lot is that across the board, we're encouraged to try stuff and do things and really try. And there is a community spirit of everyone in the class, for the most part, wants to give this a, a legitimate go. And there is no like, oh, too cool for school. I don't want to try this like everyone really wanted to try and really give it a go and I think without that support that community I wouldn't have given it a go I, I wouldn't have I would have seen myself as oh I'm not born with it I'm not perfect therefore this is not for me so yeah. I think as I as I went on and I went into uni I took that spirit with me and I took that encouragement and I very much needed that support that I got from from those leaders for me and that allowed me to uh, feel, I guess, courageous enough to actually give it a, a, a good go and go, okay, well, what happens if I try this? Where, where does this lead me? And, and I love that because you're right, people often reflect on their experience of, of Yarra and that it does present opportunities, but it's still up to the individual to say, yes, I'll sign up for that. Yes, I'll have a go at that. Yes, I'll try that. And it seems to me like music was one of those things for you. And yes. you went through that door and you, you found the encouragement you needed. Yes, there were times of challenge and difficulty and frustration, but there was also community and belonging and encouragement and support and the opportunity to, to, to sort of feel what it's like to, to, to succeed and to pr make progress. And all yeah. those things are so critically important to encouraging young people to keep moving forward. Well, you're right. It's definitely a two-way street. There were certainly many students um, in my time there that were given all the same opportunities and threw it in the bin. Um, and I know that they regret it now, but you just, just in music, for example. And, you know, there were certainly many opportunities for me in other areas at Yarra that I turned my nose up at. I'm sure the sport teachers listening right now are like, who's, who's Lauren? <laughs> never heard of this person before. Never seen her before, you know? So you're right in that, yeah, I, I, I did uh, chase it. Um, and I was supported to do so by my family, um, but it, it's certainly a two-way street. Yes, yes. Can you think of another um, experience, not within the music rehearsal rooms or even on the music stage, that you did have a go at something else that you, you know, perhaps haven't necessarily pursued it with the same passion, but it was a, a little bit of a, oh, this is interesting. Was there a, a camp or a uh, an excursion or a, an experiment that you saw happening that you thought, wow, look at that. Oh, gosh, there's so many that just you saying those words just floods my mind. I mean, whitewater rafting camp was definitely one for me. Um, I actually heard that come up in another podcast that I listened to of yours um, from I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years before my experience, and it was the same experience. Um, it was something I'm the least fit person in my year level easily, Um and me and my pal, she was the same and we were in a boat together and it was one of the best weeks of my life. I, I still often talk about my experience at the Mitchell River 
um, and, and how it changed me um, and how much I loved it. Um, you know, I would never have thought at the time that I'd be talking now about camp, <laughs> but there's so many like that. There was a great experiment that I did in chemistry uh, that was terrific uh, that we had the Bunsen burners out and uh, this might have been year 11 or 12 and had the Bunsen burners out and we were spraying chemicals at the, at the flame of the Bunsen burner to change the colours. And you were meant- Which sounds really confusing if you don't know what I'm talking about. Yes, this was this is a guided experiment. This is part, this is a SAC, I think. Like you're like, maybe a 10 or 11 SAC. Yeah, chemistry SAC. We're supposed to be doing this. So we have these spray bottles. I have some great photos, actually, I should share with you later. <laughs> uh, spraying these, uh, you know, you're spraying copper or you're spraying iron or whatever, uh, and which changes the flame to a different color. So we're learning about the colors of the different uh, chemicals and how they react uh, with heat. But uh that was a really fun one because it was it was rather dangerous, you know, and it, and it was very silly and our teacher was so excited about it and so were we. And I remember feeling very at home in the in the chemistry room. Fantastic. Speaking with uh, Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012, and Lauren, I wonder if I offer the phrase to you, Lavavi Oculus, I wonder if you that resonates with you, whether you understand what that means as a student, it's our school motto. And if you do understand what it meant, what it means, what does it mean today? I think um, at the time, in my younger years, it, it meant very little to me and, and I didn't really connect with it. Uh, but as I went on and, you know, not to uh, fluff up your feathers, Mr. Joy, but as you came along and, and you inspired me with the way that you connected with our community and the way that you spoke and, and you encouraged me to learn from your public speaking techniques and connecting with people of, of different faiths. Um, I think Lavavi Oculus for me at that time, I remember very vividly standing in the performing arts centre uh, in an assembly in the you know, downstairs as the two main sections. I remember standing in the front row of the back section um, and looking up uh, during a psalm or something and looking up at you speaking and seeing you there and thinking, wow, this person has captivated this huge group of unruly teenagers that could not, could not be tamed usually and, and don't really want to focus on, on what's happening in this assembly. But you had captivated them and you had gained their attention despite the fact that they tried very hard not to be gained. And I remember looking up at that and, and seeing the uh, Yaravelli hanging things off the back of the music stands of the band behind you and thinking, gee, this is what this is about. This is about perspective. Um, and I think since then, uh, that moment for me, Lavavi Oculus has been about, we lift up our eyes, we see beyond ourselves. Teenagers tend to have such a tunnel vision way of seeing the world. Um, and, and those times in the PSC listening to you speak and listening to the way that my cohort was reacting, it really made me realise that there is a bigger world out there if I can just look up to it and, and have a look. A very kind reflection, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that you really did take that on board because you've mentioned that you had a path in mind and then music became a real possibility and so you were willing to change. After leaving school, though, things traditionally don't always go swimmingly and beautifully. You've had some challenges along the way, whether that be uh, in career or in health or in um, living situations. I wonder if there's any challenges that you've come across that you'd be willing to talk about and perhaps where you're at with those challenges or how you've dealt with them. Yes, yeah, certainly. I think um, one of the biggest challenges I've faced in my life so far has been dealing with chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS slash ME. Um, I think that while it has been a challenge, an extraordinary challenge and an extraordinary pressure on me and my life and the life of those around me, it's also, it's been an opportunity to reflect on how I, how I engage with the world and my community. Um, so when I, I think, what was it, 2016 perhaps, I got glandular fever or Epstein-Barr virus, which is very common, as I'm sure most people would know. Um, around about 10% of people that get, maybe a little bit less than 10% of people, of young people anyway, that get uh, Epstein-Barr virus go on to get post-viral fatigue, otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome, um, or myalgic encephalomyelitis for all the doctors out there. Um, 
for a weird reason that they haven't really figured out yet, there's not a lot of science behind it yet, uh, type A personalities or perfectionists tend to be unfairly hit and that is because of the way that we treat our bodies. Um, and it turns out in hindsight, I actually was tested for Epstein-Barr when I was in year 11 or 12 because there were some other kids in my year that had had it and I had some, some of the symptoms, but unfortunately they don't, uh, the blood tests don't come back positive unless you've had it for a few months because your body needs time to build the antibodies, I believe. So I got a negative test, so we assumed that I was just a teenager being tired, but in hindsight it actually turns out I did have glandular fever in year 11 and I did go on to develop post-viral fatigue then and again later from 2016 onwards. So I guess what I want to share about it is firstly how it has affected me in the last four or five years, but also, and perhaps more importantly and relevant to this podcast, how it affected me as a teenager through VCE. Um, in hindsight, looking back um, and looking back with my family, it all adds up now and it all seems so obvious. Um, I, <laughs> I'm sure many of my past teachers, particularly in year 12, would remember that it was not possible for me to be awake in period one and two of the day. I had my head on the desk of every day of period one and two, uh, every day without fail all the time. Um, and I would just check in for the last five minutes of class and take notes of what I had to do at home later that night. But I was not well. Um, and because I was such a perfectionist, rather than resting and recovering like my body needed, I kept pushing because I wanted to get the perfect ATAR and do all of the things. Um, and I think in hindsight, had I have known the damage that I was doing, um, I would have I would have certainly changed the way that I approached VCE um, and school in general. And I think my family would too, in the way that they recognize the signs. And I think that's something that I'm really keen to share. I've, I have heard that there are a lot of parents or other Yarra old grammarians that are now parents of current Yarra kids. Um, people don't know a lot about it. It's, it's not very rare, but they don't know a lot about the impact that post-viral fatigue can have on young people. And they certainly don't know what to look for. So I think, um, there are a few things that I'd like to share um, about that. One of them being about the concept of pacing. Um, it seems simple, but pacing yourself is is one of, if not the most important ways to take care of yourself when you're under pressure. And when you are going through school, particularly VCE, particularly a high achieving school like Yara, when you really care and you really want to do all the things, you need to pace yourself. And that's more than just, oh, you know, take it easy, take it slow. It's actually a complicated process. And I would strongly encourage people to research uh, pacing and uh, post-exertional malaise, which is the type of fatigue or tiredness that you get from booming and busting, otherwise known as pushing and crashing. So I'm sure a lot of VC students or past VC students would be familiar of the feeling of just got to go, 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 push really hard, and then you collapse and sleep for two days at a time. Um, it's not healthy. It's not okay. You won't recover. Um, and it's, it's really important that people realize that young people need to rest Young people need to sleep, but also they need to pace. It's not okay to be at school from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. pushing through the entire day without resting, without eating properly, without exercising properly. I'm sure, again, my sport teachers would be shocked to hear me say this, but you need to exercise and you need to take care of yourself properly as a teenager. You're not as resilient as you think. You're not superwoman, superman. You can do it all, but you need to pace. And that means taking regular breaks. And I think one of the biggest things that I've learned from managing uh, chronic fatigue um, is about redefining what 100% means. So particularly for uh, really keen people, perfectionists, people who are keen to high achieve, um, something that is said of young people like that a lot is, oh, they always give 100% or they always give 110%. It's quite a harmful message, really, because it gives us the notion of that we can always give 100%. Um, but in truth, a healthy person gives 80%, 80% of the time, meaning that sometimes you give 100% of yourself, other times you give 60, because that's what pacing is about. But also in redefining 100%, for me, one of the biggest breakthroughs that I've had in managing my ongoing uh, fatigue is this redefining 100%. It's not about, okay, I'm going to get a task done, and that's 100%. You have to redefine this as getting the task done includes the rest time that I need after it. So say, for example, if I'm going to, I'm going to study this subject, I've got 10 questions that I need to get through and I need to smash them. And, you know, in a subject like chemistry, that's going to take you an hour and a half. 
doing that and getting 100, 100% through that task or smashing your way through that homework task might look like doing 20 minutes at a time and taking 10 minutes break after every 20 minutes. It might look like making sure that you're eating properly, getting to bed on time, taking care through your study, noticing when you're getting those warning signs of, oh, I have to read that sentence again because I didn't take it in properly. That's your body's way of asking you to rest. Um, so this concept of redefining what 100% means, it's not smashing the task. It's carefully and productively achieving a task while also taking care of your body. Wow. There's... Uh... <laughs> Obviously, learning through experience, and I guess that some of your PE teachers would say, yes, we told you that too. At the, <laughs> this is what you were coming to class for. This is what we said. And there would be numbers of your teachers who would be able to go, yeah, yeah, we, we tried to tell you that stuff. What is the difference between you now and compared with your teenage self that allows you to have understood, listened, and so beautifully uh, explained it to us today. What's the difference between teenage Lauren and Lauren? Oh, gosh. Oh, wow. Well, how long do you have? <laughs> I think it's twofold, really. Firstly, I was a teenager and not very willing to listen, which is a really bad time to be going through VCE when you're a teenager and you believe you know everything and you're not interested in taking in anyone else's opinion. Um, being a teenager is a really rough time to do VCE, so that's worth keeping in mind. Um, but I think also the missing link there for me, um, from be it my sport teachers or the, you know, the people trying to teach me about meditation and mindfulness and I wasn't interested, was about connecting it to what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be fit. I didn't want to run cross country. I wasn't interested in taking care of my body because I didn't need it. I needed my mind. Uh, but I guess the missing link that I never really accepted, although it might have been said to me in some ways, was that without your body, there is no mind. Um, and to, to have that mental, cognitive, emotional fitness, or even, you know, the bare minimum fitness that you need to play saxophone, you do need to be healthy. And that doesn't mean doing weights. That doesn't mean being a super fast runner. It means balance, you know, everything in moderation, I suppose. So I think that that was one part that was missing, but also the other part was a lack of experience. I didn't understand how what I was doing would be detrimental. I was trying very hard to do everything I could for myself. And so were my family, um, but in hindsight, a lot of the way that a lot of, I suppose, the way that I approached studying and going to school and, and life was boom and bust. It was push, 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 push. Um, and there wasn't any balance. So I think that is something that children and adults alike could reflect on balance in our lives for the long term. Um, and also helping to kids, un helping kids, teenagers, whatever, to understand pacing and self-care whether or not they want to or not is a, is a different story, but it but it should be part of the curriculum. Um, I think the way that it was set up to, you know, we had maths for 60 minutes, then we had English for 60 minutes, then we had music for 60 minutes, then we had a lunch, and then we did the whole thing, another three hours, and it was just go, 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 go. Um, it wasn't constructed, our days weren't constructed in a way that was encouraging of, of this uh, mindfulness or of uh, pacing or taking care of ourselves really it was constructed in a way that encouraged us encouraged us pardon, uh, to push ourselves and I think the wisdom that you're speaking from and the the authenticity that you're speaking from is it's relevant for students who might be in fact all of us who might be experiencing chronic fatigue but it's just generally a good message for all of us well certainly I think you know that that's the ongoing message for me you know I I got sick again in 2016 uh, because the same thing happened. You know, I, I got sick and rather than, you know, when you get something like glandular fever, you're sick for months at a time. You know, they're actually talking about it. If anyone's interested, they're talking about it with coronavirus and how they're worried that around the world, researchers are worried that coronavirus is going to cause quite a spike in cases of CFS ME because people don't know how to take care of themselves long term. They know that when you have a flu for three days, you should rest the next day and then go back to work. But if you get a virus that's long term, when you start to recover from that virus months later, you can't make up for lost time. You can't catch up. You can't push through because that's when you get post-viral fatigue. That's when you get sick. And that's what happened to me at school. That's what happened to me in 2016. And it wasn't until much later that I understood that. It wasn't that, you know, I pushed for 20 years and then I got sick. It's not what happened. I got sick. I got a virus and I didn't take care of myself. I didn't know how to take care of myself. I thought I was taking care of myself, 
but I didn't know how to recover. I didn't know how to rest properly. And so because of that, I ended up with post-viral fatigue, which is a, a, quite a long-term thing. 20% of people with chronic fatigue syndrome are bed-bound for the rest of their life. I'm so lucky, so, so, so lucky that I am on the complete other end of that stick in that my CFS is mild. Uh, but, you know, there are there are a lot of people out there, there are a lot of teenagers out there right now that might have a viral infection, that might get post-viral fatigue, that will end up bed-bound. And without that self-care, without that understanding of long-term rest, that will inevitably happen. So, so uh, you've given us lots of... Um, suggestions and tactics and things. If if you were and I, if you if you and I were allowed to go down the road and have a coffee together, and we and I said for the next two minutes, based on your experience, help me to have the catastrophe. Meaning, I don't actually want to have chronic fatigue. I don't want to actually have the heart attack. I don't actually want to have the disease or have the the accident or the but I want to live my life in such a way as if I have. Now, you have and you've recovered, and as you say, you are one of the fortunate some, but I want to learn from you. So if I, if you had two minutes, we're sitting down over coffee and we're in a world that allows us to in a little while, we might be able to. <laughs> but what would you say, what, whether, I'm a, whether I'm a 17-year-old, whether I'm a 27-year-old or whether I'm a 57-year-old, can you just give me a, a nutshell, a snapshot of what it means, whether it be pacing, whether it be balance, whether it be your diet? What are some things that I could take away and put in my back pocket to make sure I think about, oh, that's right, Lauren said this. I think... Um, catastrophe. Yeah, totally. And I think something that I, I would just slightly correct you on in, in that question is that I haven't recovered. I am recovering. I am managing. But the truth is I will never recover. I will never be as healthy as I was before this. And that's why I'm so passionate about sharing what I know. So I think probably one of the biggest things, um, one of the biggest tools that I learned um, when I was getting help uh, for managing CFS, and it is managing, it's not recovering, um, is a traffic light um, theory, I suppose. So traffic lights, obviously green, go, yellow, slow down, red, stop. So green is when you're feeling, yep, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling the way that things should be. I'm good to do stuff. With CFS, that might be, I've got some mild symptoms, but they're normal mild symptoms that I have every day. For a healthy person, that's just, yep, I feel good. I'm good to go. Orange is you're starting to get your warning symptoms. So for a person with CFS, that's some of my CFS symptoms that are more serious are starting to flare up. My body's trying to tell me that I need to slow down right now. For someone that's healthy, that might be, uh, like I said before about the concentration, that might be, oh, I, I have to reread that again. That's your body's way of saying, hey, slow down. I can't take this in right now. That's not your body's way of saying you need to try harder, um, which I think is how it's interpreted a lot of the time. Um, there, there are lots of, it depends what you're doing, but for the, the slow down thing, the yellow light thing, it's any kind of warning that your body is trying to say, hey, I'm not as good at this as I was 10 minutes ago. So that's your yellow light. And that's when you slow down. That's when you rest. If you don't, that's when you, you end up doing some harm to yourself. So the red light is, <clears throat> pardon me, for a person with CFS, red lights is serious symptoms. That's when I, I get the symptoms that are a lot more intense. They are a lot more long-term. They affect me in the long-term. They'll put me into a setback. Um, they'll mean that I, I cannot do things for the following days. Um, and depending on the severity of your CFS will depend on what, what that looks like. But for a healthy person, the red light might be, okay, well, say I'm on a bike, I'm riding my bike, I feel fine, that's green. I'm riding my bike, my legs are starting to get sore, I'm starting to lose my breath a little bit, there's your yellow. I'm riding my bike and I, like, I twist my ankle because I'm not doing this properly or I fall off my bike because I'm losing strength or I pass out because I've lost dehydration or whatever. There's your red light, obviously. You stop and your body's gone, nope, I refuse to do this anymore. I am not allowing you to do this. I will stop. Um, so I, I guess the point of the traffic light uh, idea is that you need to learn to recognize that yellow light. It's not green and it's not red. This is a great rule for teenagers learning to drive as well. I wasn't very good at yellow lights when I was a pee plater either. <laughs> uh, it's not green and it's not red. It's that yellow light that you're looking for. What are those warning signs for your body? You and you alone are very different to anyone else. You've got to get in tune with yourself. What are those warning signs? Are they cognitive? Are they emotional? Are they physical? What What's going on in your body and are you listening? Wow, that's fantastic. I love that 
that analogy, and it's it's very cool. Yeah, I'm, I I must say it's not it's not mine. I I learned that from the people. Uh, there's a, a great clinic called Active Health Clinic in Blackburn that that treat these kind of conditions. If anyone is going through it, I'd, I'd strongly recommend seeing them. I don't know whether it's theirs or they got it from someone, but it's it's a killer idea, and it really I think it it's easy to visualize. So that that makes it Absolutely. easy to use, and therefore it makes it applicable to all of us because it's something that we can recognize in our daily life it's something familiar to us but we can attach new meaning to it as well which is really really helpful so thank you lauren you've been really generous with your time and uh, and with your sharing of your own experiences and your own learnings and i wondered um, whether there was an opportunity for us to do what i like to call the quick fire round where i'm going to fire a whole bunch of questions at you and oh hit me it, it'll be perhaps the first thing that pops into your head. Um, maybe it'll kind of cause you to dip back into your uh, your memory banks for a little bit. But uh, tell us, Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012, what house were you in? Um, The yellow one. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give us more information than that. I don't know. Hughes. Yes, Hughes. I was in Hughes. I didn't get to choose though. I had an older brother, so he was put in it and then it just happened. Do you remember, were Hughes any good back in your day? Uh, well, I certainly wasn't any help to them. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> was there a particular musical or drama or performance that uh, is very memorable, either from front of stage, backstage, or maybe in the audience? Uh, look, I actually wasn't involved in the musicals. I wasn't a drama kid. I wasn't I wasn't that kind of girl. Um, I really strongly remember Les Mis, which happened when we were in year seven. I think Les Mis is probably one of the best shows Yara has put on. It's also one of the best shows in the world, in my opinion, but... That was really strong, but I think for me personally, one of the biggest performances, if you'll let me twist the question, was actually Generations in Jazz in Mount Gambia with the Yarra Valley Big Band. That that was the pinnacle of my high school career. Fantastic. And did you get a solo? Uh, yeah, I, I had some solos over the time, but actually my, my fondest memories were in year nine and ten when I wasn't the lead. I wasn't lead. I was second chair. Um, to Actually, funnily enough, the... The guy who was first chair, he was in year 12 when I was in year 10. Um, we weren't really friends in school at all. We had nothing in common other than the fact that we were both alto saxophone players. But years later, we actually both ended up studying a music degree at the same place together and we ended up becoming really close friends. So it's it's funny, you know, school never goes the way you think. I'm, I'm in contact with so few of the people that I thought I would be after school and I've become so close with him despite... You know, if I went and told 16-year-old Lauren that now, she'd be like, yeah, right, as if. But, you know, life takes you in weird places. But th- those years were the best. When I was second chair, I was, you know, and I, I had someone to look up to and learn from. Yeah, that's great. Now, for this answer, you can't say neither. Would you prefer house swimming or house athletics? Oh, um, I guess athletics because it's over sooner. <laughs> Well, no, I, I never, I never swam in the Yarra Valley pool. I was very, very proud of that. <laughs> what was your first car? Uh, my mum's hand-me-down 318i Beamer. Nice work. What would you, uh, what would be a, a regular go-to in your lunchbox while you're at school? Oh, uh, well, in the junior years, I was a big fan of the calf and it was the spinach and ricotta roll things, the pastries, which I now cannot eat because I've eaten enough in my life that like I just cannot I cannot put one in my mouth now. It makes me sick. I had so many. But in senior school, it was sprinkle sandwiches. Now, for those kids that are still listening at school, if you put sprinkles, like hundreds and thousands, in a sandwich and then put it in the school, like, toasty machine, the sprinkles melt into this wonderful, magical, sparkly purple paste. It's the best toasted sandwich you could ever have. Why doesn't it surprise me that you've had some health challenges along the way? Right? (laughs) Your figure. (laughs) Tell me, um, is there a travel destination that you would either recommend because you've been there and you go, this is fantastic, or something that you've got in the distant future that you I always want to get to? Look, for me, travel's not huge on my list, to be honest, um, and it hasn't really been much of an option since I've been not well. But when I was at uni, I got the opportunity to go and study in Prato in Italy uh, with Monash, um, which at the time I was mostly excited about for the opportunity. But once I got there, holy moly, did it open my eyes. It's Beautiful part of the world, and I'd strongly encourage anyone to do a semester overseas if you can. Fantastic. Is there a particular piece of work, whether that was a, a musical performance or in another uh, in another uh, subject area, a p- piece of work that you put lots of time and effort and dedication into that you're particularly proud of? 
oh, I can't think of anything that's not music. Doesn't that tell at all? I mean, when I was at school, music wasn't number one. You know, it was it was the seventh thing that I was focused on out of all of the things. But looking back, I have no memories that aren't music. Mm. Um, gosh, there's so many. But I think um, the preparing the music for GIJ with the big band was was a big part of it. But also my VCE's music performance uh, list was was really challenging. It took me over a year to put, to prepare and get together and. Boy, that was hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is there a, a tool or an app or a practice, a habit that you would recommend that has stood you in over the test of time? Uh, not one that stood me over the test of time. I'm a big fan of apps and tools. I love technology. Um, I guess one that sort of relates back to what I was saying about pacing is the Pomodoro technique. Um, if you're not, if you don't know about the Pomodoro, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a Pomodoro, like Italian tomato technique. It's uh, like a timer. Um, it's a way of pacing or studying to be more productive, working to be more productive. It's uh, just a little time you can get on. There's like, uh, you know, uh, internet browser add-ons or apps or whatever for it. Pomodoro technique, you do um, 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off, three or four times. And then after two hours, you do a half hour break and it just helps you to force you into it because if you're anything like me you'll just keep going for two or three hours until the job is done but that's not 100 <laughs> percent. no no as we learned earlier in this conversation yeah. that's uh, really helpful okay i as we draw this conversation to a close and and as i mentioned you have been very generous with your time i want to give you the opportunity for a 30 second brag now don't be humble about this but what's something that's happening for you right now that you're particularly excited about something that's in the not too distant future something that you're kind of working on right now that is uh is you know it gets you up and about in the morning well it's it's a strange world you know we're in the middle of coronavirus so my world's been tipped upside down you know i am a full-time i'm a muso that's that's what i do so i have gone into a lot of teaching because of my cfs it's been a, a nice way to be a bit more stable because the muso life isn't super attainable right now so but that's been uprooted even more with coronavirus, right? So even all the big gigs that I was looking forward to have pretty much been cancelled. Um, so there's not a lot of that on the horizon right now. So I guess my my big brag uh, for me right now is that I get to make a life playing my saxophone. I get paid to play saxophone. Like that's that's probably the biggest thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So you're doing something you love and you're able to make a life around that. Yeah. And and. I fell into it. I'm so lucky. You know, I, I love playing saxophone. I love playing gigs, but I also love teaching, you know, and that that was a surprise to me. And I'm sure it is a surprise to my music teachers. Um, that was a happy accident. A lot of musos, you know, you either have to, uh, you do a lot of session work or you do teaching or, you know, you have to have some kind of second job in music until you kind of get going a bit. And, and teaching is a common one. Most people do it. Most people hate it. I got really lucky. I love it. I get paid to work with young people, work with old people, all ages. I enjoy my time so much. I get to share what I love um, and I get to make a living doing it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to brag about that. <laughs> it's a pretty special combination and, and lots of people spend lots of their life looking for that combination. And uh, you are very fortunate, but also open to the possibility of it happening. And you took the opportunity when it came to find that so young so uh, congratulations to you it's a it's oh thank you it's very good i wonder as we as we really do wrap up now whether you can tell us a little bit about um this podcast is called inspired by yara and i wonder if there is a moment a person an experience a legacy that was an inspiration to you at yara Oh, so many. There's, there were so many. And, and it changed throughout my years who was around. Um, I always had a lot to do with the coordinators of every year level that I was with, and I always felt very connected to them. Um, there was one particular sports teacher, believe it or not, that I felt very connected to that really helped me open my mind um, philosophically, I suppose. Um, but, you know, it's, it's no surprise that I think – you know, looking back, if I talk to people that I went to school with, they're not surprised that I went into music because I spent so much time there. But I was surprised, you know, but it is truly no surprise that those that inspired me on a daily basis were my music teachers, you know, and uh, Than Pointer encouraged me to pursue it in my life. Um, Scott Templeton encouraged me to even give it a go in the first place and and enjoy every minute of it as I do it. And um, Matt Turner encouraged me to share it and, and do it with other people and encourage others and give back to the community. Um, so I think that that trio 
uh, really changed my life. Yeah. So thanks to Yara. Wonderful. That's great. And my final question is uh, to ask you, and then, in, in fact, for you to answer your own question is, what, what is the question that you really wanted me to ask or you were hoping that I would ask? And once you've answered that question, then please answer the question. I don't, what was the question I wanted you to ask? Gosh, I don't even remember. That was so long ago now. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to explore, unpack, uncover, or do you feel like we've, uh, we've uh, from my perspective, we've, we've done a journey? We've, uh... Well, yeah, look, I think, um, I think the only other thing that I would really want to say is that when you're young and you're going through VCE or pre-VCE, you think you know what, what you're doing. And I think out of everyone in my year level, I was so sure of what I wanted and who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And looking back now, it seems cruel that I was forced to make that decision at that time in my life. But I think I would really encourage even those who are really sure to try new things while you can. Check out new stuff while you're young and you have no responsibilities and nowhere to be without pushing yourself try stuff, do stuff, have some fun. Um, you might surprise yourself with where your passions actually lie. Lauren Breeley from the class of 2012, thank you for your time. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being inspired by Yarra, but indeed being an inspiration to Yarra. Lauren. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here and to share my story. Well, there you have it. A fascinating conversation with Lauren Brearley and I can let you know that when we turn the record button off the conversation continued and just a fascinating exploration into her own journey and the way life and people and circumstances have come together to teach her so much and I really appreciated her vulnerability and her willingness to share her own lessons along the way really appreciated the the traffic light tool about knowing you know most of us understand what green means and that is obviously go and what red means that is a, a very clear stop but the value of the yellow or the orange in the middle it's telling us something as far as our body goes and our energy levels and our health we need to be more in tune with what that yellow might mean for us pacing ourselves and there are many conversations that we've recorded now in our growing library of Inspired by Yarra podcast episodes, all of which you can find by clicking on the links through the YVG website, www.yvg.vic.edu.au. And in particular, if you head over to the community section, right down near the bottom, you'll find the podcast and all of our show notes and the library, the ever-growing library of episodes that are there for to help you stay connected to learn to glean the insights and the wisdom from those who have traced these corridors and sat in these seats and put this school tie on i hope you'll enjoy next episode too when we gather together again to chat with another yog a yarra old grammarian my name is paul joy and on behalf of everyone here at Yarra and those in particular who put this podcast together. I want to wish you another day of inspiration where you go out there with intentionality, with purpose, and you endeavour to make an impact, a positive impact, in the world around you.